it's uh, so heartening to see so many people on a Saturday morning interested in, of all things, grammar teaching. <laughs> we are delighted to have you here. Um, my name is Betty Azar. I bet you already guessed that because neither one of them look like they might be a Betty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am here with my wonderful fellow panelists, Keith Fols and Michael Swan. Um, we'd like to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we'd like to thank you for coming to our panel this morning. The title of our panel is Teaching Grammar in Today's Classroom. I just have to say first that I have never had a more enjoyable time preparing for a panel than I have with these two gentlemen over here and my colleagues. Uh, we could talk shop about grammar and grammar teaching until the cows come home. <laughs> it's been wonderful. But before we go any further, uh, let us introduce ourselves. And we're today mostly simply going to go in alphabetical order. So I will go first. As I said, my name is Betty Azar. Uh, I am the author of the Azar Grammar Series. Um, also known, I am told, as Blue Betty, Black Betty, and Red Betty. <laughs> ah, I know. <laughs> uh, I have been in the field since 1965, so that is 43 years. Um, I started teaching when I was 24. Would you like me to do the arithmetic for you, or...? <laughs> Okay, I was born in October, so don't add an extra year yet. Um, I spent most of my teaching career in intensive English programs and also taught freshman English for uh, students of a second language, university level, and the intensive English program was uh, completely to, uh, university preparation. Uh, and not being able to find the right materials for my own class, I wrote my own materials, and quite surprisingly, a number of other people liked to use them too, so that was a, a wonderful surprise for me. And uh, since then became a full-time materials writer, which I am to this day, and I live and work on Whidbey Island in the state of Washington. And now, my next panelist, I'll let them introduce themselves. Good morning. Can everybody hear me back there? Keith Foles, University of Central Florida, which is not in Central Florida. If you get the map of Florida out, you'll see we have University of South Florida off, well, way on the west side of the, of the, uh, the state, University of uh, North Florida, which is actually in the northern part of the state, et cetera. University of Central Florida, where I coordinate a master's in TESOL program. I've taught for 30 years or so, uh, started teaching University of Southern Mississippi, uh, in an intensive English program, got my master's, I was armed and ready to go overseas because I had a debt to pay off, student loans. So in 1984, I went to Saudi Arabia, was in Saudi Arabia for a year where I taught EFL and then um, didn't get enough there. So I went to Malaysia, the University of Texas system, and I taught there for three years. And then after that, um, couldn't go home yet because I still had the EFL bug in me went to Japan, where I had intended to just teach for one year. But you know the science law that a body at rest tends to remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. No, act, no outside force was acting upon me. And six years later, I found myself still in Japan. 1994, I came back to the United States, uh, decided to work on a doctorate in second language acquisition. And I had, before that, started writing materials. And I've always been interested, I don't know why, I always tell the story of when the teacher in school would come around and pass out those handouts. Remember way back those blue ditto sheets? First thing I always did was sniff the sheet. <laughs> and then the other kids kept sniffing the sheets, which would explain a lot. But I actually sat there being the nerd that I was and tried to figure out, did she write this one herself or did it come out of some company book? How did she get that font on the page? This is way back when you had to type the dittos and scrape it off with a razor if you made a mistake. Sound familiar to some people? Yes. Um, since then, I've gone on to write many other books and I'm very active in materials development and I love teaching. And I know you're here today because you know that teaching grammar is the right thing to do. Thank you. Well, hi, um, I'm Michael Swan. I was um, interested to, s to discover, looking at the program for this morning's talk, that I'm a citizen of the United States of America. <laughs> um, it came as a surprise, but life's full of surprises. Um, 
Those of you with an interest in phonetics can try to work out which part of the United States of America I come from. <laughs> um, I'm not sure myself, but I'll work something out. My background's in, entirely in English language teaching, 20 years in classrooms in Britain and France. Um, during that time, though, I worked my way down to become a materials writer, <laughs> which is uh, what I turned into. And I've been doing that for a very long time. Um, I've, a lot of my work now is on the wild frontier between applied linguistic theory and uh, classroom practice. Um, I am delighted to be here, and I'm looking forward very much to our discussion. Yeah. Well, just very quickly, I'd like to say that um, both of these gentlemen have written many, many books. Uh, one of the books that uh, Keith has written is Vocabulary Myths, and it is a teacher reference book. It is just a wonderful compilation of uh, practical teaching advice, research, and common sense. And Keith and I have been friends for a number of years now. We are TESOL friends, and that is one of the best things about TESOL is becoming friends with your professional colleagues. So we've really enjoyed knowing each other over the years. Uh, Michael is a more recent acquaintance. I've much enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, one of his books uh, is Practical English Usage, which is a real compendium of anything you could ever possibly want to know or any question your students could possibly ask about English grammar. Uh, I discovered it in the early 80s. And since that time, it has been in arm's reach from wherever my typewriter or computer has been. When I ran into him a couple of days ago, um, I said to him, well, you know, Michael, I have been picking your brain for years. And Michael said, ah, put his, his hand up here, ah. So that's what happened. That's where it's all gone. You <laughs> picked it all away. <laughs> which, of course, is not true. Um, so our plan this morning, to let you know the, the, our agenda, uh, each of us is going to speak for 10 minutes, and then we are going to post questions that have been emailed to us uh, by teachers about grammar teaching. Uh, questions like, uh, what are the pros and cons of explicit grammar teaching? Should you correct every error? Um, why do students go on making mistakes after they learn the grammar? Questions like that. Uh, wonderful questions that we got from teachers, and we thank all of you who sent questions in to us. The first 10 minutes each will go in alphabetical order, and then the questions. And I just have to say, and don't start my 10 minutes yet, that it is almost impossible to say everything you want to say about grammar teaching in 10 minutes. It is absolutely impossible. And I think the biggest problem the three of us had in preparing for this panel is that we just have too much to say. But we have, so we have agreed to uh, abide by strict time limits. So that, as I said, we don't want to talk about grammar till the cows come home. So I will um, go first with my 10 minutes. Uh, for my uh, initial remarks, I've limited the topic to uh, there we go, grammar teaching and communicative teaching, a hybrid that works. That quotation, a hybrid that works, is, uh, is something a teacher once uh, said about the two types of teaching, and I thought it was a very apt description. Uh, the first thing I want to do is share with you a quotation uh, written by one of uh, uh, students uh, who was in, a, in an entrance exam, a placement exam, for our intensive English program. And what the student wrote is, I want to explain that I know a lot of grammars, but is my problem I haven't enough vocabularies. <laughs> I think it is just a wonderful quote. I have always liked it. And of course, I couldn't agree more that vocabulary is absolutely crucial, more crucial than grammar, I suppose, if you're going to put them in a hierarchy. But it also shows that perhaps there's a place for grammar, too. Uh, and in its innocence, in its innocence, what this quote points out 
is that knowing a lot of grammar is not the point. The goal is not for our students to know a lot of grammar. The goal of grammar teaching is to help students create an interlanguage that is increasingly fluent and accurate in the use of English structures in meaningful communication. Notice I said interlanguage. Our teaching goal is not native speaker proficiency or mastery. That will happen long after the students leave our classes, if it happens at all, and for most students it, uh, it doesn't. So the interlanguage is their important medium of uh, achieving their goals in uh, university study or their uh, jobs. Um, notice I said increasingly fluent and accurate. Fluency is just as much a goal in grammar teaching as accuracy. Fluency and accuracy are two sides of the same coin. And sometimes I think it's good for us to remind ourselves that fluency does not mean the ability to speak pidgin really, really fast. <laughs> and so the goal of grammar teaching is for our students to be able to communicate meaningfully in all skill areas. In other words, the goals of grammar teaching and the goals of communicative teaching are fundamentally the same. Now I want to show you um, another sample of student writing. Uh, this one uh, will unfortunately look very familiar to those of you who teach Generation 1.5 students and shows some serious use, uh, fossilized usage problems. And that's throughout the composition. I only have 10 minutes, so I could only give you one short se uh, sentence from it. The topic is, what should happen to teenagers who commit crimes? And the student has written, if the court sent a kid in adult prisons will get worse, not better, or this, I think the society or the court need to build a new jail for the juveniles that have doing crimes, and the court should treat them as adults, but only in court. This student immigrated to the United States at age eight, graduated from a US high school with a diploma, and was enrolled in a US college at the time this was written. That's 10 years in the US school system that's 10 years of comprehensible input, at least enough comprehensible input to earn a high school diploma. This student went to school during the time the naturalist movement in language teaching was assuring us that a second language is learned in the same way as a first language and accuracy will just happen, which as we all know by now is at best a half truth. Thank you. <laughs> One of the greatest half-truths ever told, really. Um, no matter how much theory you wrap it in, there are significant, obvious, observable differences between learning a second language as an adult and a first language as a child. And as we teachers know, accuracy does not always just happen. Uh, this particular student, I, I taught a number of uh, Generation 1.5 students. The only thing that I would ever find would work would be a crash course in grammar, and even then, it was a very difficult uh, situation to reverse. And when working with these students, I would always say to myself, boy, I wish I'd had you in my grammar class at a crucial stage in your interlanguage develop development. Then by comparison, I consistently observed that the second language students in my freshman English class, uh, the writing class, the ones who had, had a, a good grounding in basic grammar, and I don't th mean anything fancy, I mean, oh, they can find a subject and a verb, that sort of thing, uh, that they were much more likely to, to have the language skills expected at a university and be able to achieve or have the, at least the opportunity to compete and succeed at the university. So when I would come to TESOL, and I would listen to speakers such as Stephen Krashen in particular and others who advocated zero grammar, were opposed to the direct teaching of grammar in any way whatsoever, 
I would always wonder if they were teaching the same students that I was teaching. <laughs> if they had to Monday morning go to class and face the same students that I was going to face on Monday morning. I found it hard to imagine. I believed then, and I believe now, that those who advocated zero grammar were just simply wrong. And I wasn't alone. Uh, during the heyday of the naturalist bandwagon in the 80s and the 90s, the number of teachers actually using grammar-based materials was increasing dramatically, exponentially. Uh, there was a real disconnect someplace in our field. But not only were large numbers of teachers supporting grammar teaching, there was, and, and it was sometimes hard to find it, but there was a steady stream of research throughout the 80s and the 90s to this day uh, that shows that grammar teaching works. Uh, in my reading of the le research literature, much of the academic community today seems generally in agreement that students in second language programs that include both grammar teaching and communicative teaching show accelerated learning and substantial gains in usage ability compared to students in programs that provide only communicative exposure to target structures. Or to say it more simply, much of the research shows that if you combine grammar teaching and communicative teaching, the students learn faster and better. There's always conflicting research and theory, as it should be in any academic field of inquiry. And we still have so, we're just at the beginning, just the beginning of understanding how second languages are acquired, or first languages for that matter. No one, no one has all the answers, and people who do say they have the answers make me very grumpy. Uh, and I will admit, I do not have all the answers. I'll let them speak for themselves. <laughs> um, but if you're interested in exploring um, a, a survey of some of the recent uh, research literature and grammar teaching, I think a good place to start would be an article by Hossein Nasaji and Sandra Fotos. Uh, you can find the citation and the information about the article on my website or copy it down here. Uh, my website is uh, Azar Grammar, it's not hard to remember, .com. Somehow, for a while in our field, the term communicative language teaching got more or less, this is, this is how I viewed it, got, the term communicative language teaching got co-opted by the naturalist movement and came to mean that if you engaged in communicative language teaching, that meant you could not engage in explicit grammar teaching but that is simply not true, and it never has been. Grammar teaching can be integrated into a communicative framework or a skill-based curriculum. Communicative methods and materials can be integrated into grammar-based teaching. There are a number of good ways of integrating the two. So the final thought I want to leave with you is this. Communicative teaching and grammar teaching are not mutually exclusive. They are mutually supportive. They fit hand in glove. They are, as I said, what one teacher calls a hybrid that works. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching of grammar in terms of a brief history of where we've been and where we might be going, where we hope to go anyway. And also I'm going to look at it from the point of view of the teacher, not the learner per se. And my main point is that good grammar teachers don't just happen. Good grammar teaching requires grammar knowledge. You actually have to know something to be able to do this job. Go figure. You need to know grammar, cross-linguistic knowledge, and you also need good teaching skills. I know many linguists. My colleagues are not here, so I can say this in my department even. Uh, it's, it's one thing to know your material, regardless of what you teach. It's quite a different thing to be able to teach. You know, two different skills. So I'll start with uh, the, the history of when I started teaching, what happened with grammar. 
1979, I started teaching at the Intensive English Program at the University of Southern Mississippi. And what did I know? I had, uh, I had um, some, ex some training and a bachelor's degree in TESOL, and they gave me a schedule and say, here, this, this is what you teach. One of my classes was called grammar. So of course you taught grammar. It's what I did at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was told to do this. Um, and I was brand new, so I didn't ask many questions. In 1984, I went overseas to Saudi Arabia, and I still had the same knowledge that I would be teaching grammar there. We focused a lot on vocabulary because it's always about what your students' needs are. And their test focused a lot on vocabulary and, um, vocabulary and listening skills. So I remember when I was teaching there, though, we got a brand new teacher into town. And this person proceeded to inform me, um, well, I went to the most, well, ended up being a, a lawsuit. So I'll go there. And his rebuttal letter was, I graduated from the most prestigious university. Prestigious misspelled. I saved that document. <laughs> he doesn't work there anymore. Um, but he proceeded to tell all of us that, no, we were wrong, because he had just graduated as well. And he knew that his professors had told him, again, people probably who weren't teaching, that you, know, you don't need to teach grammar. In fact, teaching grammar is bad. Please don't do that. Then I went to Malaysia. And I was with the University of Texas for three years there. And we had an IEP, an intensive English program. And we had a grammar class every day for the students. And I remember sitting at it. We were reading all these articles that were coming from the United States, from Crash and others, about grammar, bad, don't do grammar. And I remember sitting at the table one day. We were joking, the three coordinators. And we were all saying, um, gee, we're going to have to go back to the States and get a doctorate or something to prove, to do research, to show that, gosh, if you teach something, people actually learn it. It was going to be a new concept. <laughs> then in 1988, I was in Japan, and I taught in Japan in two different places. My first job was a university uh, where people were only doing graduate degrees, and I was shocked the first summer when I got there. These people were going to have to write a thesis in September, and it's now June, and their writing was nowhere near thesis level quality. Um, and I complained to the coordinator, you know, next year in our summer intensive program, we have to have a grammar class. And he proceeded to tell me, there is no way, you know, Keith, this might be a good idea. He was, you know, just going to give me a little bit of good feeling there. This might be a good idea. But, you know, we have graduates from many prestigious programs, prestigious spelled correctly, many prestigious programs. And he said, I can't possibly ask them to teach grammar. Okay. Um, so I insisted, and he said, what we'll do is we will let you have a class called AD. Any idea what that would stand for? Accuracy development. <laughs> we could, it was a 40-minute class, so either you ate lunch first, and then you had AD, or you had AD and you ate lunch. You can, some students didn't think it was a very important class because they were going to lunch after that. But the point was, I was told it was just such a prevalent notion that grammar was bad, I, OK, we'll let you have this class, folks, but you can't call it that. You have to call it something else. Nobody knew what AD was. And then um, after that, I, well, recently, I'll tell you, I'm working on a, a new book, a uh, grammar book for teachers. And I passed this to a couple of different readers. And there was one chapter where I wanted to explain where we had come from in grammar teaching. And I mentioned, well, you know, in the 1980s, crashing, blah, blah, blah. And the person actually took a pen to the paper and wrote, who cares? at this point. Because it, I, I took it as a very, well, first I scratched it out. But second, I, I thought, gee, we actually have come far enough now. Because 10 years ago, this kind of panel would have been co controversial. Um, but we've come so far now that actually, gee, if you teach something, you actually might learn it. That's good. All right, the next one there. Um, now, there were some good things that came You know, I always try to, when I'm teaching in a master's and TESOL program, I'm trying to situate where we came from. I know in 1979, or before that, when I was in high school, I had French and Spanish, as many of you did. I didn't become a French speaker after my one year of French in high school. And yet, well, at the time, the big emphasis was on grammar. And it was teachers at the blackboard with their list of 20 grammar items. If I cover these 20 grammar items, then I've done my job. And I can tell you now at the university where I teach, I'm in a department of foreign languages, and I hear the others, the German, French, Spanish, my colleagues, talking about, I just don't know what you guys are doing in Spanish 1 and freshman Spanish because you're not covering the grammar. But I don't hear anybody talking about communication or ability to use it. And, and as Betty was saying, the purpose of grammar teaching or any teaching of languages is to be able to do something with the language. It's not to be able to recite the rules back. But I still hear my colleagues with this old, older mentality of if we cover the 20 items, we've done our job. 
and therefore you should be able to do something with it. Um, at that time, grammar teaching, I, I would say, really wasn't, um, it wasn't very productive. It was more about learning rules. Having said that, we've had, what, 25 years of I plus one or I plus two, pick your number, and what's happened? I don't, in the United States, I don't sense lots of freshmen and sophomores being able to speak Spanish and French and whatever after years and years of having this implemented in our school system. The example um, that I give there is if you're going to be doing uh, grammar, to move away from grammar for grammar's sake. And you know, we have that old example of la plume de ma tante, my aunt's pen, my aunt's pen repeat after me, and your, pen did, your, your, aunt, your aunt didn't have a pen and you had no reason to talk about this situation, but I've covered possessive. Noun, de noun, check mark, number 16. Um, but unfortunately for grammar teaching today, even some really well-intentioned teachers, when it comes to certain grammar points, or uh, for example, I pick past perfect because it's one of my least favorite ones to teach, but past perfect, and they'll say, well, I have to spend a whole week on past perfect. No, you don't. Do you think that on day five is the magic day when something suddenly happens and, gee, they've gotten it? Grammar is going to, you know, as Betty was saying with inner language, these things are going to take time to develop. And when you talk about, or people, uh, teachers commiserate, well, I've taught this and they just didn't get it. Part of it is, why would you think that the one time is going to do it? So I, I talk about spending a week on past perfect, or why are you teaching order of adjectives? I, yes, I know that adjectives have a certain order, and if you put five in a row, they'll have to do this, this, and this, but I... Tonight, when you're flying back, or tomorrow, you open your in-flight magazine, which has lots of descriptive adjectives. Try to find a sentence that has more than one in front of a noun, <laughs> let alone five. We don't do it. And so if your students can't do it, there might be a reason why uh, no one wants to do that. Now, what does it mean to be a good uh, uh, grammar teacher? Um, you really have to know um, grammar well, really, really well. Not because you're going to have this uh, amazing ability to recite rules, but because you need to know your subject material better than your students. That's teaching 101. <laughs> How many times have I been, I've done coordinating and administration work a lot, the thing I cringe is when I hear a teacher tell a student, the student will ask the question, why do you put ING or whatever? And then this, this teacher will say, well, I've never thought about that. That's okay, because many times you haven't thought about that. The wrong answer is to go on and say, gee, your grammar is better than mine. You know more about this than I do. And sometimes it's true, unfortunately. But don't admit that. And then you should be ashamed, and you should run home and try to correct it. All right? All right, the first, so the first point for 3A is that you really need to know your, e your ELL grammar really well. Um, the third thing is you need to know mistakes. You need to know something about your students' first languages. Now, no, I don't mean you need to be able to speak French or Spanish or German, whatever, but again, you, need, you can't move your students from point A to point Z if you, can't, if you can't recognize point A. So when a student makes a certain kind of mistake, you need to know that whether this was just a fluke or if this is something that's pretty systematic coming from that person's first language. So some examples there of Spanish and French, I have hungry, and you know, I hear uh, teachers who aren't very familiar with grammar and say, I don't know why they keep making that mistake. Well, actually, if you paid attention, it's very systematic, i.e., there's a grammar to it. Um, and there's a reason they're doing that. Or an example from Arabic or Farsi, Mr. Richards is the man that I told you about him yesterday. And you'll see that that's actually a very systematic error. And the third thing, for maybe Chinese, Japanese, using the double um, connectives there, because Jose is from Mexico, so he speaks Spanish. And you'll see some of your students are doing this and some of your students aren't doing this if you're teaching as I am in a program where we have different languages in the class. And it's not that these people got it better than those people. These people don't have a first language where that they're going to translate that mistake into English. You need to know that. Some of the best advice, I know in the United States, a lot of times um, I'm working with College of Ed, sorry, I'm College of Ed, College of Ed people where it's, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to tell any of our pre-service teachers that you have to know something. You know, you are accountable for this information, and yes, you control whether you learn it or not. Um, uh, I, I run into this a lot where people don't want to tell teachers that, uh, about the knowledge they might need, and I remember I had a professor way back when, Dr. Fontecchio, and somebody said, what if I don't know anything about these languages? And his answer was, then you shouldn't have the chalk in your hand and be at the blackboard. 
you're not qualified to do this. Now, not knowing one thing and saying it's not important is one thing, but not, you know, if you don't know something, then try to find out some of these um, errors. And there are lots of good books, I think of Learner English, Michael Swan, where you actually have comparisons of different first languages with English uh, on different grammar points. You don't need to know 50 million grammar points and how they're handled. The three that I've given you right here, these are actually pretty common mistakes. All right. And then the third thing I wanted to say there is that you actually need to know multiple ways of teaching grammar. So a lot of times uh, I've, taught it, I've talked past perfect and nobody got it. Well, you probably weren't the, weren't the first person who taught past perfect to them. So did you run to the blackboard and put a diagram on the board and then stand away in awe and say, here it is, I've now presented past perfect. You need to know multiple ways of introducing this material. So things like problem solving, drills, drills are good. It, I, it always amazes me when I teach a methods course and I'll ask, what do you know about drills? And then there's silence and somebody will say, well, they're not good. <laughs> yes, because Dr. So-and-so told us. And Dr. So-and-so hasn't taught a real language person in 20 years. There's nothing wrong with the drill. It's, it's maybe the fact that you, you're listening to a mistake or a pronunciation problem. Your ability to go outside of that and do a drill really quickly first of all implies that you know the grammar issue. You can't do a drill if you don't know the grammar behind it, and then also you have to have had practice in doing drills. But other things there, pair work, games, explaining grammar step by step, and the last thing is not depending on your book. Too many teachers, I think, rely on the book. Well, it wasn't in the chapter, so I didn't mention it. Or, or I spent a whole week on Past Perfect because they had 23 pages in that chapter. Don't let the book run the show. You are the teacher. Your grammar book is a tool. And on that note, I will pass it over to Michael. Thank you. I think looking back over the very many years that I've been in this business, um, the one thing I really feel able to say is that there are three golden rules for successful language teaching. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, I was a, when I was a young teacher with strong opinions and lots of hair, I, <laughs> I, I did think I knew this, <clears throat> but age brings confusion. There's a wonderful Polish poet, Wisława Szymborska, a very wise woman now in her 80s, and she wrote in a recent poem, I'm no longer sure that what's important is more important than what's not. <laughs> it's about how I feel. But there are half a dozen things that I do feel quite strongly about still, and I'm going to say what they are. First of all, I think we have two important sources of enlightenment in our profession. One is academic research and the theorizing that goes with it. The other is the accumulated knowledge experience, wisdom of the teaching profession, the language teaching profession. Both of these are important sources of enlightenment. Neither of them is totally reliable, um, but they both need to be paid careful attention to. And the overwhelming message from both sides is that grammar teaching does make a difference. Um, we can be pretty sure of that. Grammar is just the different kinds of patterning that go on in language, that language uses to get some meanings across. Um, it's harder to spot patterns than to spot the words themselves, and one some may need help, a learner may need help to see what they are. Um, take German, if you've tried to learn German, especially if you've tried to learn German just from simple exposure, uh, there's a problem with where the verb goes. In German, the verb's all over the place, and it can take a long time to get a sense of where to put it. But actually, if somebody points out the pattern, it becomes very, very easy. The verb comes second, that's all. Um, it can come after the subject. John saw Mary yesterday. Or it can come after an adverb. Yesterday saw John Mary. Or it can come after the object. Mary saw John yesterday. Um, it just comes second except in subordinate clauses where it comes at the end. That's all. <laughs> and if somebody explains that to you, it saves an awful lot of time. A second example, um, somebody writing about this recently 
um, was talking about her experience learning Spanish. She said, on a personal note, I'm trying to learn Spanish. I've done it in a hit or miss way, but I've listened to hundreds of hours of Spanish on radio and CDs for three years. Yet I couldn't grasp how the comparative and superlative were formed. Finally, I looked it up in quick fix Spanish grammar. And I now have the pattern. <laughs> It'll take practice to use it correctly, but now I know the pattern. And I think people who advocate zero grammar are denying students the right to this kind of information, which will help them. And I don't think they should do that. Um, sure, um, it's important not to do too much grammar. Grammar can fill the horizon. But to react against that, to go to the other extreme, I think is just um, counterproductive. Um, I haven't got much patience with that attitude. Um, don't need to teach grammar because it comes from comprehensible input. Well, some of it does and some of it doesn't. Um, anybody who thinks that complete accuracy comes from comprehensible input can't have met many immigrants. They certainly never met my brother-in-law, Johnny Birchuk. Um, I guess using the term comprehensible input for my sister's discourse is stretching it a bit. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, my, John has spent all his life exposed to English, and his English is diabolical. <laughs> um, I feel strongly that evidence is important. You can't prove your point just by saying it in a loud voice. A lot of people do. Um, evidence matters. And we have increasingly good evidence that teaching some grammar helps learners. Um, I say some grammar because um, I think we can confuse ourselves seriously by overgeneralizing. The philosopher Bishop Barclay said, we first raise a dust and then complain we cannot see. And I think we tend to do that. Um, general statements about whether you should teach grammar or shouldn't teach grammar or how you should teach grammar don't, I think, work very well. Grammar's a lot of different things. Uh, these things are learnable or not learnable in different ways. Learners are in very different situations, three hours English a week or 12 hours exposure a day. Uh, learners come at different levels with different mother tongues, different language learning purposes. How can you possibly generalized to the extent of laying down simple precepts about whether or how to teach grammar. We should be asking, I think, how should we teach this point to this person with this mother tongue in this situation? And if so, how should we teach that particular point under those circumstances? One moment while I sort out my bits of paper. <laughs> I think uh, one extremely important thing, therefore, in our business is prioritization. We can't teach all the grammar there is. Our business is to pick out what our students need most and can learn and teach that. And that's going to depend very much on, among other things, the learner's mother tongue. We don't set out to teach the grammatical system of a language. We set out to teach the parts of the system that the learners have trouble with and need. So it's, it's quite bitty. And finally, um, it's extremely important, I think, to be realistic. Um, language teaching revolutions tend to happen because people are dissatisfied with the results that they're getting. They say, oh dear, you know, we're, we're teaching all this grammar and they aren't learning very well, so we better have a language teaching revolution and stop teaching grammar <laughs> or something else. And pendulum swings backwards and forwards because of this dissatisfaction with what's going on. Well, we're going to go on being dissatisfied. Languages are too hard for most people to learn in real time. There are one or two people in a thousand who, as adults, can learn a foreign language perfectly so as to pass for a native speaker. Those people deserve all of our admiration, and I hate them. I really do. <laughs> the rest of us aren't going to do it, nor are our students. Um, 
So I think I want to stay clear of rejecting what we're doing because it's not getting perfect results. For me, the typical sound of a language teaching revolution is a scream, a splash, and a thud as the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. <laughs> um, change, development is good, but throwing out everything you've done because you're not getting perfection isn't good. I like that um, quote that um, I think was first um, made by Winnicott and picked up by Bettelheim about parenting saying that children don't need perfect parents to grow up properly. They need good enough parents. Oh, oof. <laughs> and same with teaching. We need good enough results from good enough methods, um, not perfection. Thank you.